simple veterinarian is struggling with a diagnosis, when an exotic zoo animal is dying of a rare disease, or when a rancher's cows are sick, there is one place animal lovers are likely to turn. The University of California Davis Veterinary School practices groundbreaking animal medicine that is changing everything from the treatment of complex, often fatal diseases to the way endangered wildlife is protected. Hello, my name is Paul Fotenauer, your host for a program about the service that veterinarians provide to animals and to you and me as well. We will take you to the heart of California's dairy country to see disease prevention in action and to the home of a family struggling to keep their beloved dog alive. In our first story, a team of research veterinarians are examining the complex relationship among elusive mountain lions, threatened bighorn sheep and deer that are colliding with people moving into the mountains of Southern California. Ken Logan is a scientist and his mission is to capture one of nature's most elusive animals, the mountain lion. For months now, he has been crisscrossing the south flank of Little Stonewall Peak in Cuyamaca Rancho State Park, east of San Diego. Mule deer are plentiful here, and that's what makes the park prime habitat for mountain lions. Logan is one of a group of scientists from the University of California, Davis, who are tracking the secret life of one of California's last large mammal predators. Even though cougar populations in California have rebounded since the early 1970s when hunting protections were enacted, these animals remain hard to find. This morning what we've done is we've checked our snare line and we haven't caught anything. That's normal. It's normal to spend the morning checking the snare line and not finding a cougar. Wildlife experts feel that cougars can roam in 100 square mile territories and can travel 30 miles a day, generally feeding on deer and other small animals. While Logan looks for cats in the area where backpackers, bicyclists, and campers recreate, Walter Boyce, who directs this research project, is working this day in the upper elevations of Anza Borrego Desert State Park in San Diego County. This is home to the Peninsular Bighorn Sheep, which are near extinction. There are a number of, of real problems that are happening here in San Diego County, in particular in Anza Borrego Desert State Park and in Cuyamaca State Park. We have a bighorn sheep population that's endangered. It's dwindling to the point that it's on the verge of extinction. We have a mountain lion population that very, has a very strong advocacy in this state, yet is clearly the direct cause of bighorn sheep decline in recent times. We have a human population growing faster, really, than anywhere else in California, and that really epitomizes what's going to be happening throughout the West and indeed the entire United States. All of these are coming together here in San Diego County. What we're hoping with this project is to not only come up with answers for what can we do for bighorn sheep, but the bigger question is how can wildlife and people coexist in the future? The Peninsular Bighorn, which range from Palm Springs to Baja, number around 400, far less than what was seen in these ranges years ago. Boyce, who directs the Wildlife Health Center at UC Davis, says changes in the landscape are altering the lion's normal hunting pattern. We think, we hypothesize, that deer may be drawing mountain lions out of the higher elevations to where the sheep occur. And on the flip side, people at the low elevations are pushing the sheep up by building their housing developments, by recreational activities. The sheep are essentially getting squeezed between the deer at the top and the people that are at the bottom into this ever narrowing ribbon of habitat and the mountain lions now are moving through that ribbon and unfortunately taking a heavy toll on the sheep. This work involves helicopters and teams of field researchers who capture deer in order to apply a radio collar that allows the scientists to track the deer's movement. These same collars are also being applied to the sheep and the lions. Linda Swainer, another UC Davis biologist with more than 10 years experience studying mountain lions, is tracking cougars already fitted with radio collars. I'm listening for signals off of three different male pumas. Each one has a radio collar with a different frequency. And I can pick them up. I can pick up all three of them from here at different times. Anza Borrego Desert State Park is, is just a tremendously diverse 
set of habitats from near sea level all the way up into the pine forests and, and connecting with Cuyamaca Rancho State Park. So in this study, we're hoping to really look at, <clears throat> at the whole, at the entire complex of ecosystems and the dynamics that flow between those. A project of this scope and magnitude takes teams from diverse backgrounds. Although UC Davis is leading this research program, it has key partners in the California departments of Fish and Game, State Parks and Recreation, and the Zoological Society of San Diego. Meanwhile, back at Cuyamaca Rancho State Park, Ken Logan is busy yeah, set, checking his puma. lion snares. Uh, we know that pumas have traveled this trail here, and the idea is that a puma comes and puts its paw in the snare set, depresses the foot loop, and they'll catch it around the leg like that. Logan's first concern is to maintain the health of the lion while it's ensnared. We've designed these snares to be as humane as possible for the mountain lions that we've captured. They have several safety features on the foot, foot loops themselves in order to allow for adequate circulation to the limb. There are bungee cords on the line in order to absorb shock. We also uh, place these snares in as safe a locations as is possible. Now underneath here... Logan and other scientific is... aides check these traps every day so no animal remains in a snare for long. When one is found, it is tranquilized, examined, and fitted with a radio collar. Jim and I are already learning how they're using this terrain, as well as learning how their movement patterns can affect people. Because if you follow this path that these two cats traveled, and Jim and I have done that, and you go over this saddle and drop down the other side, guess where you end up? Los Voqueros Equestrian Camp, a site at which there has been a number of encounters between lions and humans in the past few years. We we're just going down the trail and he came from the right and cut across in front of us to the left. Yeah, there's plenty of them here. Logan can often determine the cat's gender by simply looking at the track left by the paw in the dirt. These are tracks of a male mountain lion. And they're huge male tracks. You can see it's four toe prints, one, two, three, four, and this is its hind heel pad or its hind planter pad. This cat movie was moving from west to east. He's going up the East Mesa Fire Road and he may be um, lying M1 because we just received signals from M1 up on East Mesa. The findings from this study could help resource agencies solve one of their biggest problems. We're very interested in the study for the park because this, is, uh, this area has proven to be a, uh, one of the, the biggest areas where we have human mountain lion interaction. And to help us in managing both our park visitors and our mountain lions to keep them both safe, uh, we would like to get this study, get the information done out of the study so we can figure out how to best do that. As more people move into mountain lion habitat, wildlife experts expect to see increased human lion encounters. The managers here of the park have concerns that they want to uh, uh, minimize the type of negative interactions that you might have between mountain lions and people. But we also want to maintain healthy mountain lion populations and uh, allow for a lot of uh, human enjoyment of this particular state park. Park officials and conservationists expect education to be the key to saving mountain lions and minimizing their threat to humans. This study is going to give us real data, data on wildlife that we can base management decisions on. And it's a real challenge for us in the future, looking at, at habitat loss and fragmentation, having to make important decisions that influence both people and wildlife. And unfortunately, we often have to do that without adequate information, and I'm confident this study is going to really help us get that information that we need that's going to really benefit wildlife. What they learn in San Diego County may become the model for managing populated wildlands throughout the West. Next, we'll look at veterinarians who work in the important field of animal agriculture, with recent outbreaks of devastating animal illnesses like foot and mouth and mad cow diseases, veterinary medicine is fighting animal health threats on a global scale.
They are scenes once thought unimaginable. Wholesale destruction of entire livestock herds in England and in Taiwan. Millions of animals lost. The contagion on the prowl. The virus causing foot and mouth disease. For health professionals here in the U.S., it amounts to a national security alert on a microbial level. I want to assure you that we are continuing to work vigorously to ensure that we have all the programs in place to keep the foot and mouth disease out of this country. We ask, are we scared of this disease? I think a better term is respect. We really respect this virus. Protecting the integrity of the nation's food supply, in this case meat and dairy products, is a top priority. In the search for answers, the University of California Davis School of Veterinary Medicine is playing a leading role. What we try to do is bring individuals from a variety of different backgrounds together to address an issue or a problem. We don't stay focused on a very narrow area of science, but we try to get out and identify all the different factors that may be involved in these disease outbreaks, and then we'll meld those together as an approach to solving a problem. In the case of foot and mouth disease, researchers at UC Davis are providing critical information for developing strategies to manage outbreaks. Though the rapidly spreading virus poses no direct threat to humans, it is devastating to livestock, causing rapid weight loss, painful lesions, and corresponding loss of production. Even with heightened attention, the chances of the virus slipping into the country remain high. For that reason, the best defense may be a good offense. Here we're looking at approximately 2,200 herds uh, within the three-county region of California. The in this computer lab at UC Davis, thousands of simulated foot and mouth outbreaks in California are already underway. We're investigating alternative eradication strategies for foot and mouth disease. Specifically, we're looking at um, use of vaccination or what they've been doing in the UK, which is a continuous cull or um, a slaughter of herds that are not necessarily infected, but herds that are close to a known infected herd. Uh, hopefully limited kind. Researcher Tom Bates and Professor Mark Thurman are working on a mathematical model that covers a wide range of foot and mouth outbreak scenarios. It is an innovative approach. Begin fighting a disease outbreak before it ever appears. We know that models aren't perfect and that we uh, are simulating these hypothetical epidemics. Uh, but we think that there is value in comparing these various scenarios uh, for control to see which ones might offer the best options for control and uh, presumably at the least cost. Nowhere are the stakes of a foot and mouth outbreak higher than in California, the nation's largest dairy producer. Estimates are that bringing a foot and mouth outbreak here under control would cost between seven and 14 billion dollars. The dairy sector is uh, very concentrated. The size of the, of the dairy industry and of the individual herds in California is vastly larger than it is in the United States, in other parts of the US or in England. To help control an outbreak, researchers at the UC Davis Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory in league with the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory hope to develop an innovative field diagnostic tool. The plan calls for adapting technology developed for detecting biological warfare agents in the Gulf War. By zeroing in on key genetic markers, foot and mouth could be distinguished from several other nearly identical diseases, perhaps in mere minutes. Once an animal is diagnosed as having it, having those rapid tests on site in the county where it's occurring makes it so much more efficient to determine this herd has it and this herd doesn't. One key benefit could be a reduction in the need for costly preemptive slaughter of animals a practice health professionals here in the U.S. are eager to avoid. Those type of programs create a lot of heartache and a lot of concern in, in the producers and I think that there would be some tremendous resistance in, in our country, especially if it were to come out later on that some of our diagnoses uh, were not substantiated when f they were checked into uh, further. But the fight against emerging diseases in animal agriculture goes beyond diseases like foot and mouth. Researchers are delving into the inner workings of other ailments like Yoni's disease and the notorious bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease. 
Mad cow disease is believed to result from the practice of feeding livestock meat and bone meal products back to livestock, a practice now banned in the U.S. But research at the UC Davis Dairy Food Safety Laboratory is focused on eliminating the possibility of accidental infection. The danger is, is perhaps a mistake could happen. In a feed mill, they would have ruminant meat and bone meal, and then they start mixing cattle feed that day. Then there could be an accidental contamination. Uh, we're looking at developing a rapid diagnostic test so we could screen and make sure that no accidental uh, feeding takes place and then puts the livestock in jeopardy. Yet even as foot and mouth and mad cow disease draw worldwide attention, I'm gonna give her 40 cc's. A far more widespread threat to humans and animals is growing resistance to antibiotics. We gave her five injections. I won't go any more than five days in a row of penicillin. As in human health care, curbing overuse of antibiotics is a top concern for veterinary health professionals. So yeah, there's some, some level of antibiotic use on these farms, so we'll have to check to validate the records. Dr. Bill Sisko is leading important research on antibiotic resistance in domestic animals by tracking just how antibiotics are being used on ranches and farms, a program called Prudent Use. Prudent Use is application of antibiotics in this case appropriately. So you know that the antibiotic that you're giving is effective against the thing you're trying to treat. It's the right dose and it's given in the right amount. Or it's given in the right uh, way. So that's really prudent use. It's, it's helping people to use antibiotics more intelligently. One key aspect of prudent use is standardized record-keeping practices on how antibiotics are used. This will be the site where we have the links. Dale Moore has now made prudent use part of an online training course for ranchers in the dairy industry. I'm hoping that we're going to be providing them with some education maybe a change in attitude towards keeping records, as well as providing them tools and the kinds of records that they need to keep. With more accurate information on just how antibiotics are being used on farms, researchers hope to get a better understanding of how to avoid the pitfalls of overuse. The crux of it is, is that we, we probably never get to go backwards. We never ever reclaim an antibiotic, or with much difficulty do we ever reclaim an antibiotic that's developed a lot of resistance. But what we can do is slow down the rate that we accumulate new antibiotic resistance. And that's the goal. For veterinary health professionals, the effort to keep the nation's food supply safe from such biosecurity threats will continue to call for innovative and imaginative measures. What we're doing is essentially public health. We're trying to prevent the uh, public from being exposed to harmful uh, substances that could be in the food supply. And we feel that uh, this is a very important part of having confidence in our food supply. That will keep American agriculture uh, at the forefront of, of providing safe, healthful food for our consumers. Veterinary medical health professionals remain on a heightened state of alert to threats of newly emerging and re-emerging diseases. Although all small animal breeds and ages can suffer kidney disease, it is often deadly if not treated immediately. As veterinary doctors learn more about kidney diseases in dogs and cats, it will ultimately help in the diagnosis and treatment of human kidney disease. Now meet the Evdokimovs, who are hoping that advanced treatments in animal medicine can save the family's best friend. Ben looks pretty comfortable perched on this table at the veterinary hospital at UC Davis. This six-year-old Labrador retriever has been here for more than a month for treatment related to acute kidney failure. His case has perplexed veterinary doctors here who are among the best animal kidney specialists in the world. Ben was a very sick dog when he came to this hospital. The dog's owners, Jim and Lori Evdokimov, said Ben's condition deteriorated quickly. But, you know, Ben was 103 pounds when this started. He is now probably, the last we saw him, he was 66 pounds, and he's just becoming emaciated. On advice from their local veterinarian, Ben was immediately transferred to the intensive care unit of the UC Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital. 
Emergency medicine is measured usually in seconds to minutes, not in hours. So patients that present the way Ben did are immediately transported here to our emergency room. And within two to three minutes, some type of analysis of their blood and whatever therapy is required has been instituted. Although all breeds and ages can suffer kidney disease, it is often deadly if not treated immediately. The question everyone wanted to answer was why would Ben's kidneys, a dog in its prime, fail? Dr. Larry Cowgill, a UC Davis veterinarian, has spent 30 years understanding the dynamics of kidney function and is considered one of the nation's leading researchers in animal kidney disease. We have two major groups of kidney failure, acute kidney failure, as we would see in Ben, where the kidneys are temporarily, hopefully temporarily damaged, but certainly damaged very suddenly, and have the potential to get better. Uh, the other category is chronic kidney failure, the most common condition in which dialysis is used in human medicine, where the kidneys are irreparably damaged. Back home in Pleasanton, California, the family began looking for clues as to what may have caused Ben's kidneys to stop working. <laughs> you see any water down there? Could it be water contaminated by bacteria? The doctors were saying that this leptospirosis comes in stagnant waters. And there's a lot of stagnant water down here in this ivy. And then it goes out through the front. And Ben was all, he's always down here. Could it be the antifreeze leaking from one of the car's radiators? The family desperately looked and their concern deepened. The decision was made in the intensive care unit that Ben needed to begin a costly series of hemodialysis treatments. This machine functions for the kidneys, filtering blood, removing waste products and excess fluids from the bloodstream while maintaining the proper chemical balance of the blood. Kidneys are vital organs. When the kidneys fail, toxins accumulate and if left untreated, death occurs quickly. The dialysis per se does nothing to treat the underlying disease. What it really allows us to do is to keep Ben alive for that period of time that's necessary for the kidney to really heal itself. Each treatment costs $325 and most animals that require dialysis need to undergo this procedure at least three times a week. Scott, who is the closest family member to Ben, is concerned about his dog's discomfort. Um, Dr. Calgill, do you know if Ben is in like, any pain? Generally, we don't perceive that these animals are in pain. We, we never have to stick them with needles. Uh, all of the treatment is done through this special catheter that's in his neck. Um, he sometimes acts like he doesn't feel very well, like you might if you had a flu, uh, something like that. But uh, typically pain is not, uh, not a problem that we would perceive in him. That one's one of my favorites. Yeah, that was, our, that was at Sue's house, huh? It was a puppy. Mm -hmm. Ever since he was a six-week-old pup, Ben has had an influence on each family member. Well, for me, because I work out of my home, Ben is constantly by my side. Whether if I'm out in the garage working, if I'm at my desk, he's underneath the desk. Um, he just was always with me. Meanwhile, back at the hospital, the doctors are concerned that Ben's kidneys are not showing adequate recovery and feel they need to do a biopsy of the kidneys to gather more information on their chase for a cause. Well, the key to the kidney biopsy is just to get the outer layer of the cortex. And that's what we're going to be shooting for while trying to stay away from all the important structures like the bowel, aorta, big vascular structures. After a 15-minute procedure, the tissue sample is taken to pathology for examination. After a family meeting, they decide to continue dialysis for one more week. We're into this now with Ben for over $11,000. Um, right now I'm unemployed. Uh, it's a situation where we love Ben very much, but we have to make a decision. We're charging this. It's not something that we had the money. And so we're going to be expensed for this for a long time. But, you know, as a family, when, you know, my kids look at me and said, Dad, we just can't let Ben die. Um, you know, there's, there, there, there was no way that I could do that. I knew I had to go forward with it. We had to have the hope. 24 hours later, the doctor talks to the family by phone. I, I did get the biopsy report back today. It does confirm that we have an acute kidney failure. 
um, and it is uh, attempting to repair, it does not suggest what the underlying cause of the kidney failure was. But the majority of the dialysis currently performed in veterinary medicine is for acute dialysis, and so there are short-term treatments compared to human medicine where most patients are on indefinite lifetime dialysis. So I would say that the typical course for most of the conditions that we deal with in dogs and cats would be two to four weeks. There are only four veterinary centers in the United States that are equipped to perform dialysis on companion animals. The UC Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital operates two of the centers, one in Davis and the second in San Diego. The one here in Davis does about 600 treatments a year and was the first to perfect the procedure in dogs and cats. It's a, a very technologically involved procedure and so there are a lot of, of complications that can result from the technology. Uh, there's risks of infection and risks of clotting within the animal. So it's not a panacea, but it certainly is a, a tremendous help and tremendous adjunct for dogs with acute failure that, that otherwise would die. After six weeks of dialysis, Ben is not showing signs of improvement, and the family decides to end his life. And many times we just have to give up, say our goodbyes, just like the family says their goodbyes, and, and it's just as hard on us as it is on the family in many cases. We were with Ben for weeks and weeks and weeks. He was, he was our pet as much as he was anybody else's pet. We now have technologies like dialysis that were never available in the past and now are a source of, of salvation for many, many animals, and our success rate in treating animals with conditions like we thought Ben had is very, very high, uh, approaching 95%. And we will learn from Ben's example, perhaps that he has a new kind of disease that tomorrow we'll be able to deal with because we've had the experience in him. So in some cases, he serves as a legacy for the successes of the future. Veterinarians will continue pursuing cutting-edge medicine to improve the lives of animals and those of us who love them. Thank you for joining us. Bighorn sheep population that's endangered. It's dwindling to the point that it's on the verge of extinction. We have a mountain lion population, yet is clearly the direct cause of bighorn sheep decline in recent times. We have a human population growing faster, really, than anywhere else in California. What we're hoping with this project is to not only come up with answers for what can we do for bighorn sheep, but the bigger question is how can wildlife and people coexist in the future? We're trying to prevent the uh, public from being exposed to harmful uh, substances that could be in the food supply. We now have technologies like dialysis that were never available in the past and now are a source of, of salvation for many, many animals. <laughs>